Welcome to the Zacherlidge Cast podcast, YouTube video interview program that features me talking to some of the best and brightest in the atheist community. Atheist slash secular slash awesome community. This is episode number 184. I'm recording this live on March 8th, 2019. Thank you, Casper Rigsby, for being on last week. Please buy his books. He has a lot of them, and they're short reads. If you're intimidated by the whole story I was telling about reading these thousand-page books, his books are like 50 pages. Quick reads, relatively cheap, and then you can get a feel and go, oh, do I like this guy or not? And give him a few bucks for God's sake. We need more sane, well-thought-out voices like him. Also, come to the National Nuns Conference, March 23rd, 24th, NashvilleNuns.com. This week, I'm just going to talk down to earth in a language everyone can easily understand. Okay, enough of the FDR crap. It's a solo show. Uh, the guest timing didn't work out this week, and I hate to go a week without doing a show. <clears throat> and once this is over, well, I think a couple, no, a couple of listeners really like it when I just talk, and then the rest think, well, at least the show is shorter. So I'm going to tell a story. Uh, I thought this was a good time to do it, um, since it is Lent, and um, the atheist version of Lent is putting a banana Chiquita sticker on your forehead, and that's my um, Twitter picture has that. So the first time I can remember going to church is when a girl I was dating invited me. I believe this was my junior year, and in that time realm, I was finally figuring out that it's possible to ask someone out and them to say yes. I joined the debate club at that time, and I learned something important. If you want to meet someone to go out with, it helps to have an interest in common, and that was ours. It was something that we didn't have in common that caused that interest to wane about two days later. Uh, it was a Protestant service of some kind. I had no idea what was going on. They were standing, they were sitting, they were singing, there was a lot of call and response, and then it was time for communion. I'm not even sure if I knew what it was. I joined in because I'm a joiner, ate the wafer, drank the grape juice, and by Monday she wanted to have a talk. It was a short talk. I don't recall saying anything. So when it comes to church services of any kind, I have been an outsider. I think that's one sneaky reason behind this show is to learn what that religious mindset is from people who used to have it and the naturally fascinating process one takes to extract from it. I've been to a few Catholic church services in the past 20 years. My parents joined a church in Nashville a little after I left the hospital for good. Check out episode 159 for that story. My father was Western Orthodox growing up, and my mom was Eastern, and in the late 60s, that was a reason for their families to not be happy with them getting hitched. Uh, also, my mom was pregnant. Religion was not a topic of discussion growing up. We never went to church, and my most immediate family members uh, were in the same boat. This did change in the early 2000s. My parents joined a Catholic church in Nashville, and my sister-in-law converted to Catholicism a few years before that. My youngest nephew is a sophomore in high school, and last weekend had his confirmation. I will admit my ignorance on how the whole baptism, confirmation, and other steps are done. I was there for one of the baptisms, the baby one, no choice on that. Then there was a second ceremony that both nephews did around age 10 in which a bunch of the little kids dress up like they were getting married and were told by a dude who's not allowed to have sex that they were literally eating their god. I say it in this way not necessarily to make fun, but to show that something that for one side is a sacred ritual looks absolutely bonkers to the outsider. I don't do well as an outsider, although I don't do a ton of to make myself an insider. I've been a joiner, but more to clubs, like finding the debatey actor types late in my high school years, and being close with some of the journalism nerds in college, and being part of an Atlanta newcomers group. In the past 10 years or so, I get nervous when I join a Facebook group. So the reason for this solo episode is that last weekend there were two events that we were going to attend. Um, the first was a musical. Well, let me kind of set the scene. So here's the situation. My brother, sister-in-law, and nephews live approximately three miles from me. 
and I almost never see them. The only time I see them is when my parents come down from Nashville to visit, and this was one of those occasions. So this weekend, we had a couple of events. The first was a musical. When you get invited to a musical held in a building of a Catholic church's campus, a rollicking good time is about the last thing you expect. It was Honeymoon in Vegas. I had seen the movie, but good googly moogly, it was a while back. The basic story is that a dude is loath to marry his long-term girlfriend because he promised his mom never to marry. He decides to take her in Vegas on a whim to get hitched before he changes his mind, and in a moment of cold feet gets in a card game, loses his ass, and quote-unquote loans her to the card guy to settle the debt. Then he wins her back. Even in the 90s, this should have set off my SJW or decent human being alarm bells. But that the story itself is not really the point here. It's just this is what I, we were watching. The show surprised me. I kind of thought it was going to be super G-rated due to there being a pretty mixed audience, but they said hell at least four times. There were skimpy outfits, and the act of sex was referred to as freaky freaky. The acting and singing were kind of what you would expect, but everyone was giving their all. They had crazy set changes that seemed to happen every four minutes. My brother was in the stage crew, put a pin in that for later, and almost three hours later the show was finished. We had to return to the campus in 12 hours. My parents are amazing. They've really gone to extremes to get in shape in their retirement years. My mom, due to high blood pressure, Parkinson's disease, and not much else to do in retirement, and my dad joined in. But they are going to get their wine. Maybe that's why they like the church. It's an excuse to have a belt before noon on a Sunday. Probably not. But in any case, we got home after 11 on Friday night. And for me, super late drinking tends to hit me harder than quantity, so I passed, but they had to have their glass or two before bedtime. Like I said, they are legends. On Saturday... We went to church because um, this is a very special episode of the After School TV movie called Teenage Kids Get Confirmed to the Catholic Church. And how much of the Catholic Church history can we teach them with maybe not teaching them about all the current present issues with the church? This was like a super double special church visit because they crammed in an entire service and the confirmation of about 100 of these teenagers. The entire middle section of this pretty giant church, I don't know if like a thousand people fit in there, uh, was just the confirmed kids. I, I couldn't tell if any adults were being confirmed because a lot of the kids had their sponsor who in that case was for the most part an adult. So every time I enter a church, I think, so that's where my tax dollars go. The churches tend to have giant ceilings, ton of stained glass, wood carving, and super white Jesus and pals. I won't get into white Jesus. Uh, maybe this is the only time I do like a quote-unquote deep dive into Catholicism. But what from, from what I hear in my podcast travels, even in the black church, Jesus is as white as pizza dough. I saw a painting that depicted a version of Jesus that I had seen before in my sister-in-law's kitchen and other places and made fun of it in atheist circles. It's the laser Jesus. This is Jesus, white as dudes in the Middle East aren't, but middle-aged illegitimate sons of popes sure are, with red and blue lights coming out. Maybe it was my kitty flashbacks to the old man lightsaber duel between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi that made me look at the colors instead of where the lights originated. It was... Jesus' sacred heart. If a little kid drops his plastic chicken toy and you pick it up for him, you might be turned into a saint. The Catholics only have one God, they'll tell you, but they play on their polytheistic origins by making real humans into demigods. They also make body parts sacred. I wondered what the deal was with Jesus' quote-unquote sacred heart and why the church decided to separately make that into a thing. They have a lot of things. I often wonder if people don't question their beliefs because there's so many events and feasts and saints having visions of Jesus coming to them. Not to tell them about electricity or antibiotics in the 17th century. No, he wanted them to praise him more. That does sound like they're Jesus. The narrative consistency checks out. So let's take a nod to citation needed and look at one Wikipedia entry about the sacred heart of Jesus with optional commentary. 
So listen to the big click of me changing over to actually read this. This is the Wikipedia Sacred Heart of Jesus page, and I will link to it in the show notes, and I will read it until either I or you stabs himself with a fork in the eye. The devotion to the Sacred Heart, also known as the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, Sanctissimum Cor Lesu in Latin, is one of the most widely practiced and well-known Roman Catholic devotions, taking the heart of the resurrected body as a representation of the love of Jesus Christ God, which is his heart pierced on the cross and in the text of the New Testament is revealed to us as God's boundless and passionate love for mankind. This devotion is predominantly used in the Roman Catholic Church, followed by the High Church Anglicans, Lutherans, and Eastern Catholics. In the Roman Catholic Church, the liturgical solemn nights of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus is celebrated the first Friday after the octave of Corpus Christi, or 19 days after Pentecost Sunday. Nobody said there would be math. I believe this year that date is July 1st, 2019, so... Get excited on that week. You get this event plus the new Donald, praise Donald Trump and America event on July 4th, coincidentally. The devotion is especially concerned with what the church deems to be the long-suffering love and compassion of the heart of Christ toward humanity. Long-suffering, we'll get back to that in a minute. The popularization of this devotion in its modern form is derived from a Roman Catholic nun from France, St. Margaret Mary Alconque, who <laughs> said she learned the devotion from Jesus during a series of apparitions to her between 1673 and 1675, and later in the 19th century from the mystical revelations from another Roman Catholic nun in Portugal, Blessed Mary of the Divine Heart, here comes that heart theme, a religious of the Good Shepherd, who requested the name of Christ that Pope Leo XIII consecrate the entire world to the sacred heart of Jesus. Predecessors to the modern devotion arose unmistakably in the Middle Ages in various facets of Catholic mysticism, particularly with St. Gertrude the Great. I do want to mention March 8th, 2019, although I think maybe March 8th every year, International Women's Day. So it is fun to see that in this case here about the sacred heart of jesus a lot of the people who got this thing rolling were women so there are female saints isn't that nice description the sacred heart is often depicted in christian art as a flaming heart shining with a divine light pierced with a lance wound encircled by a crown of thorns surmounted by a cross and bleeding Sometimes the image is shown shining within the bosom of Christ with his wounded hands pointing at the heart. The wounds and crown of thorns allude to the manner of Jesus' death, while the fire represents the transformative power of divine love. I'd have to go and officially study the Gospels, and I'm not going to do that to actually figure out if in all four Gospels... Jesus died not from hanging on a cross for three hours and bleeding out, but by being pierced in his side. And I actually didn't know that the the spear that pierced him, in theory, pierced his heart. I mean, that's pretty good work there by the uh, Roman centurion in the case. Now, the history of this whole thing is very confusing because I mentioned earlier that there were visions in the 17th century and then a pope consecrated the heart in the 19th century. But wait, there's more. History of the devotion, early devotion. Historically, the devotion to the sacred heart is an outgrowth of devotion to what believed to be Christ's sacred humanity. During the first 10 centuries of Christianity, there is nothing to indicate that any worship was rendered to the wounded heart of Jesus. And I do think that's an important point. How do these religions continue when they can be obviously seen to be crazy and based in a, on no history whatsoever? Well, they just keep changing it. I do wonder if the sacred Jesus junk will become something people will worship later. I mean, I feel like they're being smart in this way. You know, you've got to save some body parts. Like, you got to work your way through the body. The revival of religious life and the, the zealous activity of St. Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Francis of Assisi in the 12th and 13th centuries, together with the enthusiasm of the Crusaders returning from the Holy Land, bloodlust is a f wonderful thing, 
gave a rise to devotion to the passion of Jesus Christ and particularly practices in honor of the sacred wounds. That's right. There are five sacred wounds we're going to learn about. So take some notes, people. Devotion to the Sacred Heart developed out of the devotion to the Holy Wounds, in particular to the sacred wound in the side of Jesus. This is the spear that went into his heart, we think. We don't know. The first indications of devotion to the Sacred Heart are found in the 11th and 12th centuries in the fervent atmosphere of the Benedictine or Caesarean monasteries in the world of Bernadine thought. But it is impossible to say with certainty what were its first texts, <laughs> texts or who were first devotees. Kind of like the early history of the church. There's not a lot, actually, that, that exists to today. I think legend helps in this case. And by the way, if you're somewhat ADD like I am, every paragraph has like six different links. So to get through this whole thing is a freaking miracle. St. Bernard died 1153, said that the piercing of Christ's side revealed the goodness and charity of his heart for us. It took 1100 years to come up with that. The earliest known hymn to the Sacred Heart, Sumi Regis Cor Eveto, is believed to have been written by the Nobertine blessed Hermann Joseph of Cologne, Germany. That's where Christy Winters is. The hymn begins, I hail thee kingly heart most high. For the 13th to the 16th centuries, the devotion was propagated, but did not seem to have been embellished. <laughs> it was everywhere practiced by individuals and by different religious congregations, such as the Franciscans, Dominicans, Carthusians. Among the Franciscans was a devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, has its champions in St. Bonaventure, decent basketball team, and is... Vitus Mystica B. John de la Verna, and the Franciscan tertiary saint... I wonder what a tertiary saint is. Jean Hudis. Bonaventure wrote, Who is there who would not love his wounded heart? Who would not love to return him who loves so much? It was nevertheless a private individual devotion of the mystical order. Nothing of a general movement has been inaugurated except for similarities found in the devotion of the five holy wounds by the Franciscans, in which the wound in Jesus' heart figured most prominently. So we're worshiping the heart of Jesus that was pierced, which is what they think is the wound that caused the death of a god. But the death of the god was necessary so he could come back and save humanity by making absolutely no changes to how things work in the world. I feel like this is a lot like Danny in Game of Thrones who had to have her husband and child die in order for her dragons to be born and her to gain power. Hmm. Game of Thrones, April 14th. I may skip some of these saints because there's a saint in 1246, there's a saint in 1258, St. Gertrude the Great. Now, if you're already a saint, do you need the great added at the end? I'm just curious about that. Another saint, Mary Alcoque. <laughs> this was in the late 17th century, so this was actually starting to get some uh, attention. I think I wanted to mention, so there's Sister Mary of the Divine Heart. And Sister Mary was the one who got the Pope to actually consecrate the entire world to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Um, there was the first, so this is the timeline. First Mass, 1353, Pope Innocent VI, Innocent, great name for a, for a Pope. And then consecrated, finally, 600 and almost 650 years later. And we might as well, so... Worship and Devotion The Roman Catholic acts of consecration, reparation, and devotion were introduced when the Feast of the Sacred Heart was declared. So you didn't have to do as much stuff before then. That was cool. And his papal bull, Octorum Fide, and honestly, if atheists can't come up with a version of a papal bull, we're not even trying. Pope Pius VI praised devotion to the Sacred Heart. Finally, Leo XIII in his encyclical Anum Sacrum, 1899, Consecrated every human to the Sacred Heart, that includes me, the idea of this act, which Leo XIII called the great act of his pontificate, this great act is like, hey, this body part is holy, had been proposed to him by a nun of the Good Shepherd from Apito, who said that she had supernaturally received it from Jesus. Jesus said, worship my heart, motherfucker. 
Groups, con congregations, and countries have consecrated themselves to the Sacred Heart in 1873 by petition of President Gabriel Garcia Moreno. Ecuador is the first country in the world to be consecrated to the Sacred Heart. In your face, Vatican. Peter Kundrin of France founded the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary on 24th December 1800. A religious order of the Roman Catholic Church, the order carried out missionary work in Hawaii. Uh, this mother, there's so many versions and the timeline is just all over the place. Like the, so the Pope did the thing in the end of the 19th century, but at the end of the 18th century, another guy did a thing and a mother in Italy did a thing and a worship sacred heart hymns existed and the feast, uh, has actually been in the calendar since 1856. The enthronement of the Sacred Heart is a Roman Catholic ceremony in which a priest or head of household consecrates the members of the household to the Sacred Heart. An image of the Sacred Heart that is been blessed, either a statue or a picture, and then is placed in a home as a reminder. So that's why the picture is there. The practice of the enthronement is based upon Pius's declaration that the devotion of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is the foundation on which to build the kingdom of God and the hearts of individuals, families, and nations. Only took you 19 centuries. In the Roman Catholic tradition, the tra Sacred Heart has been closely associated with acts of reparation to Jesus Christ. Hey, if we can repar give reparation to Jesus Christ, how about descendants of slaves? And these encyclical, oh gosh, Missentius Redemptor, Pope Pius stated, the spirit of expiration or reparation has always been first and foremost placed in the worship given to the most Sacred Heart of Jesus. The Golden Arrow Prayer directly refers to the Sacred Heart. Devotion to the Sacred Heart is sometimes seen in Eastern Catholic churches, where it remains a point of controversy and is seen as an example of literal Latinization. Yeah, good luck with that. And what's great about this is, you know, what's coming up in the next couple of months is the last Avengers movie, which involves a lot of teams coming together to defeat a foe. Well, what's the greatest alliance in history? There's alliance of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. It makes perfect sense that there are spiritual links between uh, Catholic devotions between the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The joint devotion to the hearts was first formalized in the 17th century. Seriously, I'm very confused. By St. John Udes, who organized the scriptural, theological, and liturgical sources relating to the devotions and obtained the approbation of the church, prior to the visions of that saint with the name I can't pronounce. In the 1956 encyclical, Pope Pius XII encouraged the joint devotion of the hearts. And in 1979, Pope John Paul II explained the theme of the unity of Mary's Immaculate Heart. Now, Mary exists in the Bible only to agree to be knocked up by God in her preteen years, have the boy, and then be there when he died. That's pretty much what she does in the Bible. And so they say her heart and her virginity, of course, are immaculate. What if, uh, and as someone who doesn't believe in the historicity of Jesus, uh, so probably not Mary, uh, but what if there was a historical character? What if we could time travel and go back there? And what if we found out that Mary died of heart disease? Wow. Just blew my mind. There are promises of the sacred heart that were made to the Saint Mary, Margaret Mary Alacque. So these were the promises that Jesus made he promised these blessings through her to those who practice devotion to the sacred heart so i want to send these all to my catholic friends along with um a few articles about a cardinal pell here they are and then i'll probably stop i will give them all the graces necessary for their state of life i will give peace to their families i'll console them in all their troubles i will be their refuge in life and especially in death this is all stuff that you don't have to actually do. I'll abundantly bless all their undertakings. Sin sinners shall find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Infinite ocean of mercy. Okay. Tepid souls shall become fervent. 
Hmm. Ferb and Shoal shall rise speedily to great perfection. What is a perfect soul? I will bless those places wherein the image of my sacred heart shall be exposed and venerated. Again, Jesus saying, please worship me better. I will give the to priests the power to touch the most hardened hearts. I would ask for, um, what is that? Enthusiastic consent first. Persons who propagate this devotion shall have their names eternally written in my heart. It's kind of like the Stanley Cup. You know, they have to add stuff so there's room to put everybody's name on it. Uh, in the excess of mercy of my heart, I promise you that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who will receive communion on the first Fridays for nine consecutive months the grace of final repentance so that will not die in my displeasure, nor without receiving the sacraments, and my heart will be a secure refuge in that last hour. Do you feel better? I feel better. Um, and there's a little more promises made to Blessed Mary of the Divine Heart. I'm sure that was awesome. There's something called the scapular of the Sacred Heart. This is what I talked about earlier. Uh, Jesus asked that uh, it was Estelle, F-A-G-U, it's like baguette with F at the beginning. So it sounds like faggette, which sounds like something that anti-SJWs are going to catch me out of context and destroy me with. Following the claims by Estelle that the Virgin Mary appeared to her in 1876 and requested a scapular of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a scapular of the proposed design was approved by the Congregation of Rites in 1900. Again, another example of a maybe not real character from the past coming in and not giving you anything useful but saying, worship me and my son better. I mean, considering... I would be like, hey, motherfuckers, I lived and died. I had a full life. And all you talked about was me getting knocked up by a god and having a kid and then watching my kid die. And then that's it. You know what? Build me a motherfucking scapular. I'm with you, Mary. I am totally with you. There's a lit litany on the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It's about as long as every song in a Catholic uh, thing. And I've been talking for darn near... 30 minutes here, so I think that's probably enough of that, but I'm going to transition. Uh, so the pin on my brother thing. Um, he works the stage crew for this musical, which is a lot of work, and it's like staying late every night. He's also a volunteer lacrosse coach at his kid's school, which he pays a lot of money for. He does sound at the services and basically is a gopher for the church. They don't pay taxes. They certainly don't do much to help the kids who have been scarred for life and sexually assaulted. They constantly ensure that Jewish people, gay and trans people, people who are not married and having sex, divorced people, and me, are targets for at least the kind of hate thoughts that Jesus said was a sin. But that was about sex, so it's okay. Anyway, free labor, a horde of Nazi gold somewhere, a city-state, please Google Cardinal Pell, and that's why I didn't convert. Uh, I mentioned uh, Lent, so don't need to go there again. Uh, I was going to include a book review. I just finished reading uh, the uh, latest Star Wars book, Thrawn by Timothy Zahn, but I think I'll save that for a future book review episode because I find the character and his history getting uncanonized and brought back into the post-Disney Star Wars world worth a deeper dive, so I'll stop with that for now. So live read! Nanocon is what? 15 days away? I'm going to be in Nashville in two weeks. If you think you can string two tin cans together, you can be in on the podcast panel. So reach out to me if you're interested. You can buy tickets for Saturday and Sunday's events. So uh, if you can only make it to one, well, do Saturday because I'll tell you all the podcasting secrets. Like if you want a big audience and tons of sycophants who can Twitter dogpile people you don't agree with, do something other than what I'm doing. Be kind. Quick, tri quick trip to the culture wars um i listened to a show recently that featured kevin logan and mike stuchberry who do a youtube show called let them eat keck about the kekistani crazies so if you know the name tommy robinson you know that british grifters are a bit different than american ones First of all, they have cool accents. Second of all, fake name. Third of all, they are more sensitive than that part of the female anatomy that they are probably not familiar with. Kevin Logan interviewed his co-host, Mike Stuchberry, who has been writing about Tommy. 
So there was a lawsuit regarding Tommy Robinson, who is a super duper right wing grifter in UK. They are American grifters on steroids, and it's hard to believe, but it's true. So last December, video came in of, and this is in the UK, of a Syrian boy being bullied, and it went viral. Tommy Robinson made it into a race thing and called the bullied a bully. So he went after a child. A lawyer approached the family of the boy. A lawsuit was crowdfunded. Mike helped. A letter was delivered to Tommy and address with his name attached anyway. And the police officer delivered the letter and a group of people who don't really like Tommy delivered this to his address. So then things got personal. This is where the whole, oh, it's fun to do a show online and be a bit of a social media personality gets dark. Tommy and his quote-unquote friends went to Mike's house because they thought he was behind the lawsuit and just knocked on his door at like 11 o'clock at night while he and his wife stayed inside. And again, came back at 5 in the morning and then loudly said, we're coming back after I go to the gym. It's all fun and games and honestly, it's neither of those things to play the game of YouTube response tennis. But everything has to get heightened or the passion dies and that means someone's getting threatened in real life. And it's pretty ugly when it happens. So I will send a link so you can check all that stuff out and uh, see what happens. So if you want to support this show, be like Bobby, Hugh, Teoti, Larry, Daryl, and the other Daryl, and go to patreon.com backslash Zacrilege. Follow me on Twitter at Zacrilege. Like the Zacrilege cast page on Facebook. Send all mail to Zacrilege.cast at gmail.com. Seriously, don't do 100 people download this a week. Give me some suggestions. Sometimes... I uh, don't do well with my scheduling and get a guest on. So thanks to my family for inviting me along last weekend. I'm sort of the invisible sheep in this regard because I don't like conflict and I really don't know what they really believe. It's impossible to say what each person believes in a really big hall where the leaders are telling you to think the same. They'll never control your thoughts as much as Jesus' lasers try to pry. At least you still have that dignity. I will have Bryce Blankenagel on next Monday night to talk about well, we'll get there. Also, NanoCon. So next week, let's continue the conversation.